In previous videos, I explained why Ethereum is scaling on layer two and not layer one, and how the modular vision has emerged to support this layer two rollup centric future. In this video, I'm going to zoom in on ZK rollups, explain how they work and achieve scale, and look at the underlying compute hardware powering ZK rollups and what the scaling dynamics and bottlenecks are there. I'm going to start this video with an explanation of this diagram here. That'll give us a good high level understanding of how ZK rollups work. Then we'll do a little crash course in complexity theory so that we can come back to the diagram and understand the significance of these uh, graphs here, these expressions and how they relate to the scaling of ZK rollups. Then we'll zoom out a bit and talk about some of the different ZK proof systems that are out there and their properties. And then uh, we'll zoom out even further, put all this in context, talking about the wider layer two landscape and maybe a little bit about the modular vision and layer three and so on. So what I've got going on in this diagram is I have Ethereum here in the middle. This whole middle column is meant to be Ethereum. The left side is an optimistic rollup and the right side is a ZK rollup. I also have, as we go down the page, the forward progression of time. So for example, if we zoom in on Ethereum here, I've got the Ethereum world state here at a given point in time, and that's associated with this block here. Then as time progresses, we move down the page, a new block comes in, and we have a new resultant world state. And to explain that a little bit further, the Ethereum world state is the set of all of the all of the Ethereum accounts and contracts at a given point in time. So each Ethereum account has an associated nonce and balance, and each Ethereum contract has nonce and balance as well, and then also some associated code and storage. And if you take a snapshot of all of this data for the entire system at a given point in time, you'll have the Ethereum world state at that point in time. And this world state is organized into a Merkle tree. You have this tree like structure, which I'm trying to illustrate here, where each of these cells, the small cells are meant to be Ethereum accounts and the slightly bigger cells are meant to be uh, contracts. And this data is hashed together into this Merkle tree. And at the top you get a Merkle root, which is like the fingerprint of all of this data. If any data in the tree changes, you'll get a new resultant Merkle root. And this data, this set of contract and account data, this is really the central core data for the entire Ethereum system. And this ability for the system to keep track of this data and allow it to change over time according to, you know, some rules and according to the, the transactions that come into the system, that capability is like the central whole point of the entire system. And the thing which computes these changes is the EVM. So the Ethereum virtual machine, the reason I've drawn it kind of like attached or connected via these little like wires to the world state is that the EVM is the thing that's responsible for mutating the world state. And of course the thing which the EVM is interpreting to compute those changes are transactions, right? So here I've got a block in this block. I have just six transactions. You know, each transaction has some basic data associated with it. I've got like the transaction hash here. And then there's a bunch of other fields, including like where the transaction's being sent to, the ETH balance that's being sent, the gas limit, and so on. So these like skinnier transactions here, they're meant to be simple Ethereum transactions where you're just sending ETH. Then you have these bigger ones here, and this extra bit of data is meant to be uh, Ethereum call data which is data that you're, you know, you're sending to some contract to some function on a contract and you're giving it some input data. So it knows what to do. For example, if you're doing a Uniswap trade with your transaction, you'll send a bunch of extra data, uh, specifying like which token you're trading and, and the amount and all of that. And these transactions kind of like the world state they're they have a, each of them has a, a, a hash associated with it, which is like the fingerprint of the transaction and those transaction hashes are hashed together into a Merkle tree and we get a resultant transaction root. We get the, the Merkle root associated with that data. I have that uh, being stored here in the block header. And in the block header, I also have here the, the world state. So when the miners take a bunch of transactions and put them into a block and then start mining the block, what they've done 
in that process is they've taken those transactions and applied them to the world state, you know, using the EVM and they've computed the new resultant world state. They get a new state root and they actually put that state root into the block header that they are, that they're mining on and they're hoping will be, you know, that will be accepted. So that's what's shown here. And then we also have the, the hash of the previous block stored in the block header. And so that's pointing up here and it goes off page, but it's pointing to the previous block. I also have in the background here, these Ethereum nodes. So each of these things here is meant to be an Ethereum node. And as you can see, there's this little miniature copy of the Ethereum world state here. And that's the same thing that I've got here. Of course, it's just sort of miniaturized and put an isometric view. So each of these machines is keeping a complete copy. They're keeping track of the world state and they're also running their own instance of the EVM. So as blocks are mined and distributed, these machines will interpret the transactions in those blocks and they'll compute how the world state should update, how it should change. That's what I'm showing here. This big cube that's made of smaller cubes is meant to sort of indicate that these, these nodes, these computers, they're keeping track of the blocks. You know, they're as blocks come in, they add them to their, their cube of blocks and they, they compute the, the changes to the world state. And so each of these machines is acting like a complete copy of the overall Ethereum system in a sense. And what happens is because you have thousands of machines doing this, following this protocol all over, all over the world, and we have this consensus mechanism, this cons these consensus rules that allow them to cohere on a given world state at some point in time, you get this emergent, like singular world computer, which is this, you know, this larger thing here. And that's kind of the whole purpose of these systems. And that's where we get this, this special property of having this, you know, this, this world computer thing. So that is how Ethereum works. And the situation is actually somewhat similar in the case of a ZK rollup. We have, you know, the progression from one world state to another. So that's what I'm showing here. I've got this blue grid. It's meant to show, you know, the, the state the set of the accounts and contracts and however it's designed, the set of all of that data in the ZK rollup is shown here in this, in this data structure. And that state changes over time as a result of transactions. Unlike Ethereum though, the, because of ZK rollup, we ultimately need to create proofs proving the validity of that state transition, you know, from one world state to another. Because we have that extra constraint, the virtual machine may be architected quite differently because we want to have the virtual machine, you know, designed such that the generation of these proofs is efficient. In the case of this, this diagram I've drawn here, this is kind of loosely inspired by Starknet, which is obviously ZK Starks and ZK Starks rely quite a bit on, on some polynomial math in order to create their proofs, which is why I've got this virtual machine drawn here with this polynomial. But ultimately at the end of the day, it kind of doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have this world state, you have a bunch of data, the system keeps track of, and you're able to change, transform this data over time, according to the, the programs you write, right? Like the contracts you write, we have a virtual machine that's a bit different. And so therefore we have a language that's a bit different. Ultimately we're, we're, we're trying to achieve the same function, which is this kind of world computer uh, function just on the layer two. And similar to Ethereum, this process of, you know, keeping track of the world state and computing the state changes, that job is done by some computers around the world. But in the case of a ZK rollup, these are sequencers. They're slightly different than the, the Ethereum nodes. And so just like the Ethereum nodes, each of these sequencers has a complete copy of the world state for the rollup, and they each run their own instance of the virtual machine. And what they're doing is just like in the case of Ethereum, they're processing transactions and they're computing those resultant state changes. So what I'm showing here up above is this big queue of, or this big market of these transactions. And these transactions are originating from a bunch of users. That's these laptops here. And these transactions are processed by the sequencers. And so one of the ways in which the sequencers differ from Ethereum nodes is that there's likely far fewer of them and they can be far more powerful machines. 
which is why I've drawn just four of them here compared to, you know, a whole bunch of Ethereum nodes. Also why I have the, you know, the state and execution portion of these sequencers as running on this big, much thicker, like computational cube thing here. And also with this little complication on the side, what I'm trying to indicate there is just that these machines can be far more powerful where in the case of Ethereum, the state and execution is running on this like much thinner sort of layer here. And that's because in the case of Ethereum, we want the system to remain decentralized. And so we need there to be thousands of nodes all over the world running the Ethereum protocol. And for that to be accessible, for that to happen, we want the cost to run a node to be relatively cheap. And so the target that has been set so far for Ethereum is that we'd like a mid-range, like $2,500 laptop to be able to sync up to the network and stay synced to function as a full node. And for that to be possible, we can't have the computational requirements to doing this be too high. The Ethereum gas limit, for example, the maximum of 30 million and the target of 15 million, that is set, you know, sort of artificially in a sense to allow for this running of a full node to be relatively cheap. We could crank that variable up and say double it, but what would likely happen is that a lot of those lower end computers would drop off. In the case of a ZK rollup, it's a little bit different. Like the sort of failure cases or attack vectors or the things that can go wrong if we have some centralization of the sequencers is very, very different than if we had that in the case of Ethereum. In the case of a ZK rollup, there's not a whole lot of things that can go wrong, which I'll talk about later. So we can have a relatively small number of sequencers and therefore they can be much higher end machines. And the advantage there is that they can, they can have a pretty large world state. Uh, however large that ends up being, maybe it's a few hundred gigs like Ethereum, maybe it's like a terabyte, hard to say, but they can have this big world state and they can, you know, they can blast through transactions. They can make, you know, maybe a thousand transactions per second, a thousand changes to the world state per second. And that's of course the point of all of this. At the end of the day, what we want to have is this world computer function and to achieve, you know, the, the dream with crypto, we need many thousands of transactions per second, even millions to happen at the end of the day. So for a ZK rollup, for one of these L2s, we have these high-end machines keeping track of a bunch of this data and allowing it to change very quickly. And then we have many of these L2s doing that all together. And what we get as a result is we get our, you know, our 1 million TPS world computer, which is the whole dream of all of this stuff. The next thing to talk about is the proof generation process. The sequencers don't have to worry about this at all. Actually, they just compute the state changes and they also order the transactions, but they don't have to worry about the proof stuff at all. They just keep on doing their job. And in parallel, we have the proof generation generation process being handled by a prover or a set of provers. The way proof generation works is we're proving the transition from some state A, some initial state, to some new state, some uh, resultant state B. So, you know, this is a world, the world state at some point in time. And then we have the new world state, maybe 10 blocks later or a hundred blocks later, or even a thousand blocks later. And this change, this transition from A to B, you know, is the result uh, of a bunch of transactions. And all of the transactions, uh, so we might be omitting those intermediate states. We don't need them to generate the proof, but we do need all of the transactions that are relevant. Like all the transactions that occurred between A and B, we need all of those. And so all of that data is inputted into the prover. The prover is taking all of that data and generating a proof. And what the ZK proof is saying is given the state A, there is a valid set of transactions. So they're, they're valid transactions. They're signed such that when we apply them, we get the result in state B. And that happens in a certain number of steps in T steps. 
and the prover is generating a proof which attests to that. So then this proof, we can take this proof and we can put it into a transaction. We can send this proof to Ethereum. That's where our verifier lives. So like the prover generates a proof and then we have a verifier somewhere that's going to check the proof and, and make sure that it's, that it's valid. In this situation here, that verifier is a smart contract on Ethereum. So the prover generates that proof and then puts that proof into a transaction and sends that, you know, that transaction happens on Ethereum. The transaction is saying, you know, send this data to this specific contract, which is my verifier and the verifier will, will process that and verify the proof. I'm also showing here that this state diff data, this set of data here is being included in this transaction, which is going to the Ethereum L1. In addition to the, the ZK proof itself, we're also sending this state diff data on chain. And this state diff data is not actually needed for the verification of the proof. The, the verifier that L1 Ethereum contract, which is our, our verifier, all it needs to verify that proof is the proof itself. It does not need the state diff data, but we do need to include this data somewhere. We need to make it available so that the participants of the layer two can build up the world state on their own if necessary. So I'll explain a bit about uh, a bit more about what the state diff data actually is. So if we zoom out a bit here, we can see that we're in this example, the layer two is proving that we're transitioning from this state here to this resultant state, you know, several blocks later. This, uh, I've drawn this world state here to be, you can see it's just all blue. Then we have this uh, purple set of transactions in the block right after, and that results in some of these changes to the world state, where I've drawn them in purple. Then we have some more transactions here in blue, and we have our blue changes to the world state, and then this uh, kind of turquoise and some more changes, and then this uh, kind of mint and some more changes. When we generate the proof, we're going from that blue state to this final one. So that's what I've got here, this all blue state and this final state with the various colors in it. And we're including all of these transactions. So four different blocks worth of transactions are necessary for the, the generation of this proof. And then what is the state diff? So it's essentially like the minimum, the smallest set of information that we would need to know how the world state has changed from A to B. So we take the diff, the diff is the difference obviously. And rather than like computing or rather than sending someone the entire new world state, right? You could just send them the whole entire state B, but that's going to be, you know, 300 gigs or whatever it is. Instead, you just say, here are the accounts that have changed. Here are the contracts that have changed. Here's like a hundred kilobytes or whatever it is. Assuming you have a copy of state A, here's this like tiny difference, a hundred kilobytes or something. Now just apply that to A and you will have B. And so for ZK rollups, we simply need to publish this diff uh, on some interval so that the participants of the network can uh, keep up with the world state and build up a complete copy of the world state uh, for a given point in time. And I'll explain a bit more about why they need to be able to do that later. This whole problem or this whole task of keeping track and making available this diff data, this is the data availability problem. So in the context of the modular chain vision, you may have heard of data availability being one of those modules. And that's what we're talking about with the state diff here. We need some data availability solution so that we can post the diff data there in such a way that the participants of the layer two can be assured that they can grab that data as needed and that it will be available and will remain available for a certain amount of time so that they can keep their copy of the world state up to date. Currently with Ethereum, this data availability service is sort of 
like wrapped up in the regular blockchain uh, function of the system. So what I mean is currently, if you want to just store some data on Ethereum, that's not actually going to be used to process a transaction. Like in this example here, I've got this transaction with a proof in it and also my state diff data. The proof is going to be used by my um, contract, my verifier on the L1, because we need to actually do some computation on that proof. We need to pr uh, verify it. The state diff data, however, though, as I mentioned, is not actually being like nothing's happening to it. There's no contract that's actually processing and reading that information. We're basically just like throwing it onto Ethereum, almost like a Dropbox kind of service. But currently with Ethereum, the only way to do that, the only way to like post data to this, to Ethereum is to take the data and put it in a transaction and almost like pretend you're sending it to a contract. Um, you just include it in the call data. And as far as Ethereum is concerned, it can't really differentiate between uh, data that's going to be actually interpreted by the EVM and actually used in that kind of sense versus data that we just want to like put on chain, don't have the EVM worry about thinking about it, right? Um, and this will change as we move to when we have uh, EI EIP 4484, I think it is, and more of these data availability services like the, uh, the data sharding, all that stuff. Then we'll have like a dedicated separate sort of way to post data on chain. But right now it just all gets included in call data. So that is how a ZK rollup works at a pretty high level. We have some world state associated with the layer two and that changes to that world state are being, are coming in the form of transactions. We have some virtual machine, which is being used to interpret those transactions. And this job of keeping track of all of that data and computing the changes is done by the sequencers, which are analogous to the Ethereum nodes. Then in parallel to the sequencers, we have the, the provers or even a single prover, probably just one prover with some backups because there's really nothing the prover can do that's nefarious. You don't actually need to have like a quorum of, of provers, but you've got some prover who's kind of running in parallel and every, you know, X number of, of blocks, it's taking like taking a snapshot of that resultant state after those blocks and comparing that to the previous state that has been proved, taking all of those transactions and it's taking all of that and generating a proof. And the proof is going on chain it's being sent to the l1 or the parent chain and there that proof is being verified by some some smart contract some code that's on that parent chain then we can verify we can prove that the state from or the state change from a to b is in fact valid and then finally like i just said we need the state diff data to be posted uh, simply so that we can as outside observers or users of the L2 so that we can build up our copy of the world state and have an up-to-date copy so that if necessary, we can actually generate proofs to exit the system if the sequencers or provers, you know, become nefarious and go offline. That's essentially how the process works. Now I'll talk a bit about the, the efficiency of each of these different actors in this whole process. But first, I'd like to do a brief explainer of complexity theory so that we can get a feel for what these, what kind of scaling we get at the end of the day uh, on for each of these machines. So what is complexity theory? Well, imagine you're one of the early computer scientists working in the field and you're trying to understand and make sense of this field of computation. Well, computation is concerned with solving problems, with operating on data and finding solutions to things. So this space, this landscape, this universe of computation is full of or is occupied with various different problems, right? And one of the things you can do to start to kind of make sense of this uh, landscape to chart these uncharted waters is you can start to classify those problems, right? There's infinite number of problems you can imagine and think of and have computers work on. But what you can start to do is classify them and see like, how is one problem different from, from another? For example, 
you have problems like sorting a list. So if you have a list of numbers, you want to sort them in like ascending order there, there's a problem and you can start to reason about like how, how difficult is that problem or uh, solving a Rubik's cube. You know, you can take these different problems and write algorithms to solve them. And then you can start trying to think about um, how they're different from each other. Some of these problems in fact happen to be in a sense, the same as each other. You can take a, a Sudoku problem and you can translate it into this map coloring problem, which you can look up. And those two problems are actually like isomorphic. So you can translate one to the other. And if you can solve one version, you have the solution to the other version. And so when you're thinking about trying to, you know, make sense of this landscape of problems, one of the ways to compare and classify these problems and these algorithms is by how hard they are to compute, right? That's one of like the main things we're concerned about with computing is I have my problem. I want to know like, how hard is it? Is it going to take me 10,000 years to compute it? Because if, if so, it's, you know, not really useful. When we're talking about how hard it is to compute something, we're generally meaning how much time does it take? And also we're concerned with how much memory it's going to take to solve the problem. These are kind of the two dimensions of computing resources, right? It's like how, how long is it going to take to solve it? And then how much memory, how much space is it going to take? And so when you start to think about how do we measure this, especially in the time domain, that's typically the one that's more often referred to as the, the time complexity. You can't just take and take your algorithm of interest and run it on like a computer, you know, like the latest MacBook and just time it because obviously there's different machines and some are more powerful, right? So we can do better than that. And one way to kind of get away from the amount of clock time it takes to solve a problem is to think about sort of like how many computational steps does it take? Because if we know it's going to take us just say a hundred thousand computational steps to solve a given problem, then we've abstracted away the computational power difference. We can say, you know, a certain computer might be able to do a hundred thousand steps, um, in like a nanosecond and another computer takes 10 nanoseconds. So by measuring the amount of computational steps, we, we don't have to worry about that difference in the performance. We can just say, well, it takes a hundred thousand steps. So you can figure out how long that's going to take on your specific machine. Now, the other complication there is that a given problem, like a given type of problem might vary in the amount of time it takes to solve it is going to vary quite a bit, probably in terms of like how big that problem instance is. So if you talk about sorting a list, the amount of time it takes to sort a given list is going to de depend quite a bit. Uh, based on how large the list is. If you have a list of 10 digits, it's going to be really fast. Obviously it won't take very many computational steps to sort that. Whereas if you have a, a billion digits, a billion, uh, elements in your list, it's going to take longer, right? So now that idea of measuring the computational steps isn't quite as good. We need something a bit more like general because we'd like to be able to classify the problem of sorting a list. You know, we'd like to be able to understand how hard that is itself, kind of like, regardless of the size, like, I don't want to say sorting a list of 1 million digits takes this certain amount of steps, but if it's a thousand digits, it takes a different number. So the way that's done is you can take an algorithm and you can analyze it and you can come up with an expression that will tell you the number of steps roughly that the algorithm algorithm takes in terms of how big the input is. So again, the, the example that's always used is the, a list sorting a list. And in that problem, the input to an expression like this here would be, uh, the size of the list. So N is the size of the list in this expression. And this expression here is attempting to give us, tell us how many steps it's going to take to sort the list as a function of the size of the list. So here it would be, uh, two times N squared plus three N plus a thousand. And so like to sort a list, it might take you a certain number of steps just to like get the problem set up or something. So that's where this constant, uh, might be, you know, you might find a constant like that. And then <clears throat> the actual, uh, operations involved in the sorting of the list, those depend on the actual size. So they have, a these terms have N in them. So an expression like this might describe the difficulty of a given 
a problem or a given algorithm, which is like a, you know, you take a problem like sorting a list, there might be many different algorithms, right? Many different ways you can sort a list. And so each of those, you might have an associated expression like that. And finally, in this area, this uh, domain of complexity theory, you don't, you tend not to really care that much about these lower terms. If my sorting algorithm is going to take a constant 1000 steps, no matter how big the problem is, I kind of like can ignore that term because it's not that uh, consequential, right? What I care about is the, this leading term, the n squared term, because that's going to completely dominate the uh, runtime, the number of steps needed to execute the algorithm. That's going to completely dominate. Like if my list is uh, a size of even 1000 elements, that's going to be a thousand squared, which is a million. So this first term here is going to be two times a million, two million steps. And then the second term is just 3000. And this one is just 1000. So that's like pretty small, right? And especially as the list gets bigger. So that's what we do typically in uh, complexity theory, the sort of the most commonly used, there's different notations, which do different things. But the one that's most often used is this big O notation. And we're essentially just taking the dominant we strip out the, the lower terms, these terms that have a lower degree, right? That are not n squared. This is just n and this is, you know, there's no, there's no n here at all, right? We take the highest term, the highest degree term, and we also remove the coefficient in this case, the two, because it doesn't really matter that much either. Like what really tells you the character, what really tells you what this problem or what this algorithm is like and allows you to classify out this computational space, what you actually care about most is just that, that, uh, that leading term. And so ultimately it's really interesting if you think about it like this, ultimately complexity theory is, you know, it's attempting to map this landscape in terms of the literal space and time needed to, to solve these problems, to compute these problems. So really what you're doing is like, you're taking this computational space and you're sort of mapping it to the physical reality that we live in, to the physics of our universe, because you're taking and mapping like the, the, the memory to the literal physical space, right? Because memory in a computer does take physical space. If you're going to have like a thousand gigabytes of memory, it's, it's going to take up, you know, a certain amount of space and, uh, and obviously it's going to take up, um, time. So that's the basic idea behind complexity theory. Uh, just for fun, I mentioned some of these problems are isomorphic to each other. They can be transformed from one to another. And a good example of that is Sudoku to uh, a map coloring problem. Here's an illustration of that. This is Sudoku represented as a graph, like a graph theory graph with uh, these nodes and edges. And you can transform it into a map uh, coloring problem. So that's kind of cool. Um, I also mentioned that sorting algorithms being one of the illustrative examples for complexity theory. So here's a table comparing, you know, a bunch of these sorting algorithms and we can see their different complexities. So like quick sort is N times log N in the best case. So for a given problem, like I said, like the problem of sorting a list, you have all of these different algorithms and they're all taking a slightly different approach to, to solving that problem, to doing that. And as a result, you get these varying uh, complexities between them. Although there's quite a bit of similarity. And in the case of sorting, there's actually a, a known best case. It can be proved that the um, best you're going to do um, on average is going to be n log n. And uh, there's lots of examples online of these different sorting algorithms uh, working and how they compare to each other. And, and you can see that some are much faster in certain situations and so on. The main kind of thing to take away is this sort of hierarchy of these different, you know, run times. So when we're talking about, you know, we're trying to classify these different problems in terms of how hard they are to solve. What are some of the, the classifications? So we have things like big O of log N. So some problems can be solved in log N time. Some are constant. It, that's like a problem that no matter how big the problem is, you can solve it in like the same number of steps. Like it doesn't matter. It gets bigger and bigger and it's still just like, boom, it takes, it takes you your thousand steps to solve. Then you have problems that are O of N. So then the, the amount of computational work taken to solve it 
scales essentially linearly with the size of the problem. You double the problem size, it'll double the amount of time it takes. And then you have problems that are like n log n, n times log n. So log n grows very slowly. And then you're multiplying that by n. It's like you're taking O of n, which would be linear. And then you're multiplying that by a term that grows pretty slowly, but it's still like a positive term. So you're still like multiplying your n by a, a positive term. So it's going to be bigger than n. Uh, and then you get into these like really hard or really uh, problems that take a long time and you get like n squared, which actually isn't that bad. And then these like exponential run times, like two to the n and so on. You probably are familiar with logarithms, but if not like really quick, you know, log base five of this number equals four because five to the power of four is 625. What this uh, question is, or this problem is asking, so to speak, is what number do I raise my base to get this um, solution? The only take the important takeaway here is just that log, like the a log function, grows very very slowly with the input. It grows essentially exponentially slowly, and uh, here's a plot of it. Right, you can see the nature of this function. You can see the inputs here on the x-axis and the outputs on the y. So we put in these like huge numbers, and the thing just almost flattens out. As I said, this logarithmic function is the inverse. It's like the inverse. It actually is the inverse of the exponential function. So this obviously is one that grows very, very fast. Here I have the base being e, e just the number, uh, the special number 2.7, whatever. Um, but you can use any base and uh, you're going to have a similar thing. It grows very, very quickly. And just a side note, if you're interested, look into P versus NP. It's kind of one of the biggest unanswered problems in this whole field of trying to chart out the territory of computational problems and classify them. Um, if you can solve this, if you can answer whether P versus NP, uh, if you can determine whether this is the case or not, you can win a million dollars, but it's probably the hardest way on earth to earn a million dollars, but it's a very interesting thing to look into. Now that we have some understanding of complexity theory, we can come back to this diagram and understand where the scaling really comes from in ZK rollups and also where the bottlenecks and what the scaling considerations are for the sequencers, the provers, and for the verifier. Let's take a look at the sequencers because the sequencers are sort of the first uh, entity in this pipeline for the layer two. You know, the sequencers are the machines that are processing all the changes to the actual rollup. They're the ones running the rollup, right? And the amount of work these machines have to do is linear in the number of transactions that are being handled. Um, having a linear relationship is great. If the relationship was super linear, you know, if it was like an N squared kind of situation, then the amount of computational work these machines were doing would grow, would like explode really quickly as you tried to just increase that, that throughput. And you would very quickly hit some limitation to the machines and you wouldn't be able to scale past that point. Because it's linear, we can, up to some point, just increase the computational power of these sequencers and just get more throughput. And so these machines, these sequencers, there's not much limitation on how much scaling we can get here. One of the limitations, though, comes in when we talk about the state size, which is why I've said here that the this uh, relationship is linear, assuming state expiry. The reason I said that is because because this, the world state for these these systems, like Ethereum for your rollup, because they're, they're organized into this big Merkle tree, um, the amount of computational power, the amount of time it takes to make changes to that tree, that increases as the, as the tree gets bigger. Okay, now let's move on to the prover. So the amount of computational work the prover has to do is quasi-linear. So it's big O of T times log T. As I talked about earlier, like O of T or O of N would be linear, right? Which is really good. That's what the sequencer is. And if you take N, you have T times log T, that's a bit more than linear, but it's growing so slowly that the shape of this graph is almost linear. 
we need to do more work as we're, you know, putting more throughput through the system. But because it's so close to linear, we can basically just increase the computational power of this machine. And that's it. That's all we have to do. And because this, the prover, we only need like one prover and maybe a backup. We don't have to worry too much about the cost here, right? If we have to have a prover that's some like state of the art, you know, super high end machine that costs a lot of money, it's probably not a big deal. There's a couple other things to consider here. One is that because computing, generating zero knowledge proofs is a pretty specialized computational process, we can potentially make ASICs for this process or something that's kind of like ASICs, right? Like the Bitcoin miners, the ASICs that are doing that job, that's custom built hardware that is, has essentially like hardwired that hashing algorithm right into the silicon. We may see something similar with these provers, ex except instead of ASICs where the algorithm, the computational work is like written right into the hardware, we might see FPGAs take on this role. And FPGAs are field programmable gate array machines. So they're like, they're halfway between like a general purpose computer and a F ASIC, which is like, you know, it's baked right into the silicon, whereas a general purpose computer can do anything. This one, you have this machine where you can essentially like give it a hardware description, almost like you give it the blueprints for an ASIC, and then it will like write that into its hardware in a sense. And then once you've configured, you've like instantiated your ASIC into this machine, you can then run it and you'll get huge efficiency gain over doing this on a general purpose, like CPU computer. Um, but it's more flexible than an ASIC because you don't have to re you don't have to go back to the fab and like rebuild your entire chip set. Um, each time you want to change the, the algorithm that you're performing. Now, the other thing to consider is that we can change the amount of time, the interval that we're taking for the settlement of these, these state changes. So we could generate a proof for every 100 blocks and send that to the L1, or maybe we wait every 1000 blocks or even longer. And this actually won't make too much difference to the prover. You know, the, because it's a quasi linear relationship, it doesn't really care if you split it up into small chunks or big chunks into small intervals or big intervals. It still has to do, you know, pretty much the same amount of work, regardless of how you break it up. But how you break it up does have a big impact on the verifier cost because, you know, for each settlement that we do, we're generating the proof and the state diff and all of that. And we're creating a transaction on the L1 and proof verification. The amount of work required to verify a proof like this is poly logarithmic. And what that means is that it's big O of log T times log T or log squared T. You know, that might sound like it's a lot of computational work because you're squaring something. But in reality, because you're squaring the log function and log grows so incredibly slowly, even when you square it, the result is pretty modest. It's very much sublinear. The computational work, which is done by the Ethereum L1, which is ultimately done by the nodes that underlie the Ethereum L1, that work has a very, very favorable uh, scaling dynamic. The cost gets, in a sense, cheaper as you put more throughput through the L2. Doing a proof for 2,000 transactions won't cost twice as much as doing a proof for 1,000. It might be like, it might only be like 10% more or something, right? And that's the great advantage, or that's why you want to, in terms of save cost savings, you want to have your proofs on a long interval. You want to be doing a proof every say eight hours, if, if that's going to be workable for your system, because the longer you wait, the more transactions you're proving in a given proof, the better rate you're getting per transaction. Now, the other thing to mention here is the state diff. So there's a cost of course, to putting this state diff onto Ethereum using the data availability services of Ethereum in the future, this will be the data shards and it'll be a lot cheaper. But this is another big cost for rollups is storing that data. And this is another area where 
ZK rollups specifically have an advantage uh, over optimistic rollups. In the case of optimistic rollups, you need to, you can compress your transactions and put them on chain, but every transaction ultimately has to have, you have to put some data on chain for every single transaction. In the case of a ZK rollup, you don't have to do that. What you have to put on chain in terms of data availability is the state diff stuff. A state diff is going to be a lot less data than the transactions themselves, because you might have in a given block or over the course of several blocks, like 10 subsequent or 10 different changes to one account. And if you're in the optimistic rollup uh, domain, you're going to have to put 10 compressed transactions on chain. In the case of a, a ZK rollup, you're just posting the state diff. So you might just post one little bit of data showing that after all of these transactions, this account has a different balance. So in general, the longer you wait between settlements in the case of a ZK rollup, the more efficiency you're gaining in terms of the data availability and in terms of the, the proof verification cost. So that is how all this stuff works. That is how we achieve scaling with ZK rollups. As I mentioned, this diagram and this data is based on StarkNet and ZK Starks. So these expressions like the polylogarithmic one down there and the quasi-linear and the linear, those are based on my understanding of StarkNet and they should be accurate for that. Okay, this video is way too long, so I'm gonna breeze through the rest of this. I mentioned the FPGAs for the provers. This is a really good post if you wanna read about that uh, from Paradigm. We also have, I mentioned the parallelization of the sequencer work. So this is a post in the StarkNet forums where they're looking at some of the things that won't be bottlenecks. So the proving is probably just fine. Data availability is another cost, but that's probably not gonna be a big issue either because we have different options there. Potential bottlenecks for like the end of day throughput for StarkNet or StarkX uh, application probably comes down to the sequencer work because I think I mentioned a lot of that work is pretty serial in nature. If a transaction acts on some part of the tree and then another transaction is going to touch that part of the tree as well, you can't do those in parallel because the changes that the first one made will affect the second one. But some of that stuff can be parallelized, just not all of it. We also have the bandwidth limitations between the sequencers. If we're electing a leader and they s decide uh, the contents of a block, they decide the order of the transactions, they need to communicate that to the other nodes. They need to take those changes and apply them to their world state. You can only do that as quickly as your bandwidth allows you. <clears throat> and I also mentioned the L2 state size, as that state tree grows, the uh, cost of processing a transaction increases as well. So you wanna keep that state size as small as you can. There's solutions already in the works for this these problems. So check those out if you like. Here's an illustration of the parallel execution I was talking about. I think it's pretty straightforward. Another thing to think about, I'm not gonna go into this too much, but you can start thinking about finality in a layer two network. You know, finality in the case of Ethereum is, you could argue every block, but you want uh, you want the blocks to have some work on them, on top of them. So you might say the finality for Ethereum is like 30 blocks. After 30 blocks, you can be quite sure your transaction is not gonna be reverted, right? And <clears throat> when you have a network like a ZK rollup, it wants to settle like maybe every couple hours so in a sense, you don't really have finality of your transaction on the L2 until it's settled on the L1. You don't wanna be settling every five minutes, like I mentioned, because then you start to lose some of that savings you're getting, right? The more activity you can cram into one proof, the better. So, but there's mitigations around this. You can get like a soft finality by having the, you know, the sequencers, maybe they lock up some bond on the L1, attesting to this intermediate state between the settlements. And so then you have some assurance that your, your transaction is in fact final to the tune of like $20 million or whatever it is. I said that I would talk about the different ZK proof systems. I won't say too much about this. 
you know, there's lots of these different proof systems out there. The main thing that we want is transparency, universal universality and post quantum secure. Universal means that the proof uh, can be used for any kind of computation. So because we want to have like this Turing complete general purpose computational system, that is the layer two, we want the proof system to have this universality uh, property. <clears throat> we also want the, you know, post quantum security, which just mean just means that assuming we had quantum computers out there that were, you know, relatively powerful, uh, lots of qubits, these proofs would not break. We also want transparency, which just means that you don't have a trusted setup, right? Some of these other systems, like they work fine, but you have to have this trusted setup where if some of that information that was used in the trusted setup were leaked, then you could potentially generate proofs that looked like they were correct, but were actually uh, fake. We also have other proof systems like Plonky2 uh, from Polygon0. Uh, sounds like it's pretty promising, but I haven't looked into it too much. Here we can see a little comparison between Snarks, Starks, and Bulletproofs. Starks, again, just have some of these nice properties of scalability. Um, we have no trusted setup. We have post-quantum secure. We have uh, the only crypto assumption being collision-resistant hashes, which is a really good thing because there's a pretty high degree of certainty that the hashing algorithms we use don't have collisions. These other crypto assumptions are stronger, like we're less certain that they're going to hold. And then zooming out a little bit, we can look at the comparison between ZK rollups and Validiums and optimistic rollups and so on. Um, I won't go into these too much, but in many ways, ZK rollups are the holy grail. As Vitalik has said, he expects long-term uh, that we scale mostly with ZK rollups. But you can see as of right now, there aren't too many ZK rollup systems that are universal. And I mentioned universality is that property of being able to generate proofs for any computation at all. There's quite a few ZK rollup systems out there, but most of them are specialized for payments or for maybe having an AMM, like a Uniswap on it or uh, NFTs, right? So we're close to reaching that holy grail of ZK rollup, a scalable ZK rollup that is universal, that we can have general purpose smart contracts on, and we can get that scalability and all of that stuff. And so that is, StarkNet is one of these such systems and is, you know, in its nascent uh, development stages right now, but it's, it's moving along very quickly. Now we can zoom out even further and put all, all of this in context in the modular chain vision. Uh, I did a whole video on this, so I'm actually probably not going to talk about it too much. It's a big topic, but we have these, you know, the blockchain world is kind of breaking into these modules. I talked about data availability. We have also the settlement of, you know, our uh, L2 activity. I talked about that with the, the proofs being verified on the L1. We have the execution, which is where the layer two is actually just computing those state changes. I showed that with the sequencers. Given this uh, separation of concerns of all of these like components of this whole blockchain, you know, functionality, we start to get some really interesting things like Celestia. Celestia is a dedicated data availability chain. You get all kinds of interesting things like sovereign rollups and settlement rollups and, and even layer threes. There's even these hybrid solutions like Arbitrum's AnyTrust, which is like kind of like an optimistic validium. So these things are changing very quickly and they're well worth understanding. And finally, we have stuff like layer threes, which again are super fascinating. You could have in the future a, like the main StarkNet, and then you could have these application specific rollups on top of that. And these, the activity on these chains on the L3 would treat the public StarkNet just like we think of Ethereum in the context of a regular L2. You would be having all this activity happen, you would generate proofs, you would settle them on the StarkNet, and then the StarkNet 
it just does the same thing. It just takes and puts proofs onto the L1, onto Ethereum, uh, proving a state change from state A to B. And Ethereum, the verifier there, it doesn't have to care about what kind of activity it's verifying. Um, the fact that it's a bunch of L3 activity and not just regular like smart contract stuff uh, doesn't matter. And doing this, you can get all kinds of interesting properties and huge, huge scaling and it's super esoteric stuff. And that's pretty much it. As I mentioned, here's the Polynia, you know, moon shot kind of estimate for what kind of scaling we can get long term with rollups and da data shards. And that's 14 million TPS, which should be totally adequate. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you have an idea for a future video, let me know. I'm probably going to do Cairo next and then maybe an optimistic rollup video. And I have this visual metaphor for the Ethereum world computer I'd like to do a video on. Uh, but if you have another idea, let me know. I'll also try to get these videos out quicker and make them shorter. I'm really trying. Um, but thanks for watching and uh, see you soon.